We we add stand here. I got uh, no no Sullivan no. Come here. Steel you record. Together. Uh, he's saying it's the other way around. I got that. I'm not. I don't work in the lab. And I get samples for the lab. Uh, iron is a raw material, right? It's, Correct. But you they probably produce it. Add some elements for the product. So at our particular sites here, we were just smelters. We were just smelters. So all we were doing is just pulling that iron out of the ore. So we were not on purpose adding anything to the iron, right? Yeah. But because the coke, which is that black material that's under the stairs there with the, the pig iron bars yeah. on top of it, since that coke is over 90% carbon, a lot of carbon gets put into that iron during that process. So our, our iron that's coming out here is a, has about 4%, 4 to 5% carbon uh, inside of it. And so, then it went out to the slag. Do it. The carbon went out to the slag. A lot of it did, yeah, but a lot of it did get pulled into that iron as well. Which and yeah. so we do use pig iron once in a while to okay. deal with uh, like getting our uh, chrome down, which they tell okay. me it's like four point three something percent mm -hmm. carbon. Yeah. Like pig iron. Does mm -hmm. That sound. That's not. Yeah, about that right? sounds about how it was here. Yeah, for so, sure. So, but we use we get steel scrap because there's a lot of it. We've got well rails super. that are coming up because mm -hmm. we do truck transportation right. in this country instead of over the rails. Right. And old bridges have to come down to be replaced. So yeah. there's lots and lots of scrap steel. Mm -hmm. Well, to get our steel in range for the carbon and silicon for the iron uh, parameters, then you need carbon and so okay. like carbon used for malleable, it's uh, right around three percent. Mm -hmm. Silicon is right one one and a half percent. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. But steel, if you analyze steel, mm -hmm. what would steel be? It's it's less than one percent. It's right. down to like uh, what, like maybe 0.5 or something at the most. That's my understanding. Yeah. So you see, that's why I'm like I said, I'm not a, a familiar with this blast mm -hmm. operation or what they say that couple as a lot of people call them cubal. Right. But right. It's actually C U P E L A. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so what was that uh, big pipe we saw coming out of the top of the furnace that went over the rail area? Um, so talking about, if you're looking at the furnace, it's like a diagonal pipe coming down. Yeah. So that's called a downcomer pipe. Um, so that's part of a gas recycling system. Because um, as we're blasting in the air, right? So a yeah. blast furnace is the blast of the air that's being pumped in. Um, pulling in, of course, a lot of air from the atmosphere, right? Mm -hmm. And then with that air mixing with the carbon of the coke, you're getting a lot of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide created inside the furnace. But the main thing is nitrogen. So nitrogen is about 51 to 52 percent nitrogen is the gases inside the furnace. Yeah. We pull them down that downcomer, connected to the funnel that you walked underneath. Yeah. There's two funnels. The funnel collects a lot of the dirt and dust to get rid of that. So it's coming out with the gases. And then the washers, which are if you're walking down that that walkway with the yeah. boilers, above you is the gas washers where water sprays through the gas to collect the fine bits of dirt. Uh, so we're recycling that flammable gas right. to burn off throughout the site. That's uh, those all those water uh, tanks and or the areas they were cisterns it looked like we had um, originally we had lots of cisterns and yeah. now of course we have a little bit less cisterns now than they used to because we had added water towers so I'm not sure if you noticed uh, the two concrete enclosures by the shed number one that yeah like graveyards right this is the, are they the, wells those were actually foundations of two big wooden water towers uh, the wooden towers. water towers didn't survive. You didn't well any water? Um, the ponds were well. Um, the ponds well, so the big spray pond up at the front, that was well water, so we welled the water there, okay. and they built other wells. It's a lot throughout. of water. It's a lot of water, but Birmingham sits in a valley, so we're really close oh, to that oh, water so table. It shows its location. Mm -hmm. That was the design. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, now, that the first ladle we've seen coming in here was huge, and I was trying to figure out the size. Oh, right. mm -hmm. That's about, that thing was probably, what, nine, uh, nine ton, would you say? I'm not 100 percent sure, but it seems like it would be. But something we noticed there were hookups. Uh, we use uh, uh, ductile iron. Mm -hmm. You cannot have over uh, what percentage? Uh, 0 0.020 uh, sulfur. Gotcha. Well, you can go up to 0 0.03 or whatever gotcha. sulfur. So we use calcium carbide okay. into the iron, and we had to hook up nitrogen through those connectors on the bottom, which I've seen they had four of them. Yeah, so, yeah, with a porous sure. plug, it had to be a certain kind of uh, uh, refractory mm -hmm. that allowed that nitrogen to go up through into the iron okay. to cause a, a reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would actually heat up nitrogen. It'll actually burn. Right. So uh, I noticed that they had four hookups on the outside. Right. Was that for ductile iron? 
That's a good question. I'm not 100% sure. So all of the labels here, none of them were used as slots. Because um, all we ever made were just pig iron bars. And so we oh, had- that's no, all they made here. All we made here was pig iron. So we didn't, had no use for labels outside of the, the big ladle car, yeah, right? The big ladle cars. Yeah, but you, where did you get these labels? We saved them from other furnaces. So um, Birmingham- They weren't from here? Mm -mm. Oh. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, actually, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, actually, yeah, no, absolutely. so um, by 1890, yeah. there were 28 furnaces and blasts around the city area. Yeah. And of course, this is the last one of this era left. All the other ones, they tore them down and just demolished so them. So they were we not part in. of this operation. Absolutely not, yeah. That's great. why it didn't the fit. The yeah. they mm -hmm. used in those ladles, uh, we use like a dry box, silica, okay. reoccur, you know, mineral silk. Gotcha. But those are, that material was like a wet cast. Okay. And we do use them around the tops and the bottoms of our furnaces. Interesting. Okay. But then we have the dry inside of that. So okay. it's like, you know, uh, so I thought, wow, they, they just figured we're mm -hmm. going to use a wet cast. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I wish I knew more about them, but I know that they came from, like, I know uh, TCI, Tennessee Coal and Iron, which was bought by U.S. Steel. We saved some from their facility before they tore it down. We saved some from Woodward and Thomas before how, they tore yeah, those how down. How far are you from Statesboro, Georgia? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure how far. Because it can't be that, can't be that far. The outfit that I work for is now called Anvil, but if you wait a week, it might be another name. <laughs> that's kind of how it was at this time. Mule Water owned it, supposedly. Okay. I hear it's all the same owners, parent, and then you and just do the old uh, subsidiary. Did uh, but, uh, Anvil. When did they stop operating here, and how did they phase it out? Yeah, so June of 1970 is when they stopped making iron. They yeah. banked the furnaces, hoping they'd be able to get past it. And in 1971, they fully shut them down. So this th last time they thought they made iron was 1970. That and thing was still them. running in 70. That's, mm -hmm. that's With a steam yeah. power from the boilers? From, the, so this, yeah, the boilers provided steam for all the machines. Yeah. Um, the furnaces were just run off of coke and hot air. Where, what was powering? It looked like a blast furnace that mm -hmm. needed a lot of steam pressure or something. Where, where did that air pressure come from? For the blasting. Um, so the turbo blowers uh, were brought in 1949, 1951, which are those two big green Ingersoll ran machines in the blowing engine building. Oh. Um, so those two, one powered one furnace, the other powered the other furnace. Before those were brought in in 49, 51, it was those eight flywheel piston blowers that are in their lower part of that blowing oh, engine building. Okay. Um, the 20 foot diameter flywheels and the 30 foot tall pistons. Okay. Um, so those that those are the old air pressure. I see. Air, um, we'll have to look at that. So we saw one in. of the furnaces had a slag in, or not slag, but had that coating in the only one of the whole portals. In yeah, the one back. of the port, you know, coming out, and you could see the uh, refractor oh, right. around the inside of the, the, you know, the actual fitting there, right. so it wouldn't melt. But the other ones looked like they were new fittings with no refractory. Right. So uh, an, uh, this site sat vacant for several years. Yeah. And so a lot of like the smaller details, some of them crumbled away. Crumbled away. And, and, and fall then off, just fell off. Just and so, yeah, not so what a lot were of those. those yeah. what, were, what were those ports for then? So those were connected to the tweeters, which are um, basically where that hot air is going in. So okay. the hot air, so there's a big bustle pipe, which is the big belt, the big pipe around the furnace. Wow. Hot air, 1200 degree air gets pumped into each of those. Yeah, 1200 degree air. And then there's the reason there's a hole there, right? Is they have a cap, they'd be able to look inside. And once they started seeing the iron and slag, <laughs> that's when they knew to open it up. So it's about okay. once every two to four hours. So they couldn't really control, contain the iron. They knew that, hey, once that starts coming, we got to be ready for it. To, yeah. That's like a channel, open it up. like steel mills. Uh, they pour into like channels. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I noticed they had a, you know, that system, a, a, right. a channel on the floor. So they they could, they didn't have a way of holding it that whenever the level of the iron would raise, mm -hmm. uh, that they had to open it, it says I'm ready whether you are or not. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And that's kind of, they, they just had to be ready. And it was roughly every four hours, uh, but of course, it's sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. And so about once every four hours, they would open it up. And just like with this big picture here, this is what you saw uh, today, right? That, that channel that goes around the side. Yeah. So that iron is just flowing out and pouring out the side. They do that more to yeah. steel. Which is actually a good timing because they have the video of it yeah. pouring out. Oh. Steel mills uh, is where oh, I see that type of Yes, sir. So this is 1955. Um, this, this footage here, about 15 minutes from 1955. So they managed to get the air uh, 1,200 degrees, but they still, it's because of the force or the speed, because you have, right. to, you have to get it hotter than that to melt on. Now I wonder right. how often they had to reline 
Great question, great question. So originally, the furnace would be out once every one to two years. You'd have to oh, reline the furnace, but. That's gotta be crazy to get inside. Oh that yeah. Thing. And now these furnaces that we have today were designed by our own engineer, James Pickering Doble, um, who designed them in the 1920s. And he designed them with, with specifically in mind to try to lengthen the lifespan. So sure. he added the water well, jacket, good. a special water jacket to it, which of course a lot of furnaces had the water, he had his own design of the water jacket redesigned the interior brick a little bit and actually lengthened it up to once every five to seven years. They would be able to, so they would have to replace the brick for about once every five to seven years. What do you um, do on your shutdown every year? Oh, we got a contractor to come in there on the holders. They come in, they do brick. We have a 60 ton and, and two 30 ton holders. Gotcha. But the melders, we just use three uh, 16 tons. We had a north uh, operation we shut down. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't need it anymore, they say. But those were uh, 23 ton furnaces, wow. three of those. But, uh, hmm. what, yeah, what, so what was that big box we saw on the, I think the number? Oh, it looks like, uh, looks like a big uh, circle thing right next to the furnace. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, a like, bunch of big motors in it. Yeah, and, it would have been like right here. Yeah. Yeah, so that was called a mud gun. That's called a mud gun, mud gun. they called it. Uh, basically, it would swivel around and just plug it up for the men. So the men wouldn't have to throw the material in and do it by hand anymore. That that um, that big circle thing would basically swim around. There's a nozzle on one end, yeah. and it would just fire that material in to plug up the furnace whenever the iron was done coming out. Oh, mm -hmm. to plug up this hole right here yes, in the exactly. bottom? Yeah, plug up this hole right here. So it would just swivel around oh. and plug it up. And there's the tweer. You can see the cap over it. So that, um, and they would just basically flip that cap, look inside, and flip it back. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I wonder how they start, like after they rewind mm -hmm. the furnace, how they actually start the process because some some furnaces are what we call continual bay. 